Okay, so now we're going to talk, aside from metal and non-metal organization, how else is the periodic table organized? So there are groups on the periodic table and there are periods, okay? The periodic table has, periodic table has seven periods, okay? Um, so if you look at the periodic table, I actually, on mine down here, I actually have the seven already written in. Um, they're the rows, okay? So if I were to zoom in, like on this one right here, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Up and down, um, my different rows would be the periods, okay? But you can write that. You can not. Uh, you can write it directly on your PDF of the colored periodic table if you want. It's totally up to you. Uh, just know that the periods go up and down. Or sorry, left and right, <laughs> left and right. Um, so the periodic table also has a certain number of groups or columns, okay? I just misspelled columns. There we go, I'll put that in in there. Um, so the columns are obviously gonna go across this way. But if I look at my normal periodic table right here, um, it's not the same as that colored one that I already have on your notes, okay? Because when we normally see the periodic table, we have the lanthanides and actinides, which are, which are this group, these two uh, groups down here. Um, they're normally just kind of with these asterisks and down at the bottom, okay? So they don't normally fit in where they're supposed to fit in, which is what this shows right here, okay? If the lanthanides and actinides were really in the periodic table, they would be just two elements high and take up all of this space and make it super duper wide. Um, so for convenience, most of the time, we really just don't uh, put them on there. If you look up any periodic table, um, it'll normally just have them kind of exerted and down at the bottom, just for the sake of convenience, really. Um, but when we're talking about groups, um, we really only count the groups on a traditional periodic table. So that would be like 1, 2, then this is 3 through 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 right here. Um, we do not count each of these as their own individual groups. Uh, so kind of kind of keep that in mind. That's why we're only going to have 18 groups instead of, what would that be? It should be 30, 32 groups, I guess it would be otherwise. Um, so it would be like 1, 2, 3, ends at 12, 13 right here, and then 18 right there. Okay, those would be our group numbers technically. So if I gave you any element on the periodic table you should be able to look at its location and tell me all right it's in period four group 10 um and the element that's in period four group 10 would be this one right here uh which i can't see on this one but that is rhodium okay uh so it'd be like rhodium all right so not only does every element have its own period and its own group but it also has its own family Okay, and like we were talking about, that's kind of like our color-coded families that we uh, like color code on this colored version of the periodic table. Um, so group one, you'll notice um, everything in group one, this first column is red aside from hydrogen, which we said is weird. Um, so we call them all the, goodness, my spelling is terrible today, the alkali metals, okay? Everything in group two is green, okay, which is our alkaline earth metals. Everything in blue down here, everything in groups three through 12 are our transition metals. Um, then you kind of skip that middle part, right? Because we were talking about how it's weird because we have these, um, we have the other metals right here, the other non-metals right here, and then the metalloids kind of going in between. 
Um, they don't really have defined families within their groups. It's kind of a mixed bag. But once you get back over here to group 17, um, we have the halogens. And then group 18, of course, is our noble gases over on the end. Okay, so for most of these elements, you should be able to tell me not only it's not only whether it's a metal or a nonmetal, but also what uh, period it's in, what group it's in, and what family it's in. Okay, and the cool thing about families is that if they are in the same family, they have similar chemical properties, which means they react the same way. Okay, so if I look at a typical group, like let's look at the halogens, group 17 right here. If I looked at fluorine and I looked at iodine, I would expect them to react in very similar ways. Okay, if I mix them um, with the same other compound or element or something like that in a reaction, I would expect them to behave the same way and react the same way, just in general. Okay, so this next bit is about uh, the natural states of elements. So when we were talking about metal and nonmetal properties, we were trying to kind of fit together solid, liquid, and gas, right? But those were things that we had to put an asterisk or a star next to because they weren't always a tried and true rule. Um, and we were talking about liquids being tricky. And I told you that there are only two elements on the periodic table that are naturally at um, 25 degrees Celsius, a liquid. And you should be able to guess one of them because I know that you have heard about it before. Um, and that's mercury, right? Like mercury thermometers from back in the day. Um, it is a silver metal. And its symbol is HG. Okay, so I might not talk about mercury as mercury in the word. I might write it as HG. Um, and the other one may be less familiar to you, but it's bromine. Okay, bromine is my non-metal liquid. And it is Br, and it is a brown liquid. Okay, so they're very different. One of them's a metal, one of them's a non-metal, but they're both liquids at room temperature. Crazy stuff. Um, gaseous elements. You do need to remember this. You need to have this memorized. Include, obviously, the noble gases, right? So that entire group 18, that whole family of noble gases, are all gases at room temperature, plus hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine. So let's go through. Let's, let's highlight that just so that you can see. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine. So when I'm talking about gases, I'm talking about this whole group plus this little this little corner right here in hydrogen, okay? And the good news is that everything else on the periodic table, everything else is a solid, okay? So as long as you can remember which two elements are liquids, which are, and I'll highlight those two for you, they're bromine and mercury. Super weird placement, right? Um, bromine and mercury are only two liquids. I only have a handful of gases. So if I can remember both of those things and I know that everything else is a solid, I then know the natural state of every element on the periodic table, okay, which is the goal. So... Um, it's not always super simple to have these individual atoms because sometimes they come together um, into what we call diatomic molecules. And if something is diatomic, it will never be on its own. Okay? Um, and there are seven elements that do this. They are bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And we use the acronym Brinkelhoff to remember them. I love the word Brinkelhoff. I bring it up all the time. That doesn't mean that you guys are going to remember it, and I'm still going to have to remind you of it throughout the year. I'd love it if I didn't have to. I wish you would remember. With, with a name like Brinkelhoff, like how could you forget? <laughs> um, but it's really super important, and I normally go around and I make everyone do these really fun cheers that I made up about Brinkelhoff to help you remember it. 
it's one of those things where I just mainly embarrass myself and you guys get secondhand embarrassment and that's why it sticks with you, which I'm fine with as long as you remember it. Um, so just as an example, um, I know that we're all missing pep rallies, right? And one of the favorite fan favorite St. Almond's Red Dragon cheers is the, the dragon cheer, right? Where everyone goes, D-R-A-G-O-N-S, like that, right? I normally make everybody do that for Brinklehoff. So just just bear with me for a moment. B R I N C L H. That's what I normally do, and I make the whole room do it. So you have that to look forward to if we ever come back in person. I'm gonna make you do the cheer, okay? Just for fun times, just for a bonding experience, so that you remember Brinklehoff for the rest of your life because you need to. It's important. Um, <laughs> so uh, now that that's over. Uh, so bromine, I'm going to write these all out, and you should too, just to kind of reiterate this for you. Bromine will never be just a plain old BR. If I find a single bromine atom out by itself in nature, we have a problem, because it shouldn't be by itself. It'll always be a BR2, two bromines put together. That's what diatomic means. Uh, the I stands for iodine, Okay. Iodine is a big old I, but it'll never be by itself. It'll always be two iodines, so I, two. Uh, nitrogen is big old capital N, and there's always two nitrogens because it's also diatomic. The CL stands for chlorine, okay, because the symbol for chlorine is capital C, little l, and there are two of them. Uh, next we have hydrogen, oops, that's H2, O is for oxygen, which is O2, you've heard of O2 before, right? Like people talk about oxygen as just O2, that's why, it's diatomic, um, they don't just say O, and then fluorine is the last one, F2. So you should have memorized the seven diatomic elements, Brinkle, Hoff, Bromine, Iodine, Nitrogen, Chlorine, Hydrogen, Oxygen, Fluorine. Okay? All right. Last little bit here is the non-metallic solid elements can have varied structures compared to solid metals. Um, so we were talking about how there are only a few non-metals, and I'll use another highlighter color down here. Um, so like carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, selenium, and iodine, essentially. Those are our only solid non-metals. But they, they are a little bit weirder. They can have some different structures because they are non-metals. Um, and these different structures are called allotropes. And the most common example of allotropes that like occur naturally in nature and appears different things are the allotropes of carbon, of which there are three different ones, okay? And two of them should be familiar to you. Um, I would normally make you guys predict this and, and listen to the wild guesses of what's pure carbon and what's not. Um, but one of them is diamond. Okay, so a diamond is literally just carbon. And another one is your pencil lead. It's graphite. That is just pure carbon. That's it. And the last one you've probably never heard of before, but it's called a, get ready for this, it's called a Buckminster Fullerene or lovingly referred to as a buckyball. And I highly encourage you at the end of this video, which I need to wrap it up because I'm about to go over my time limit, um, is to go and Google <laughs> what a, a Buckminster Fullerene looks like or a buckyball. It's, it sounds way cooler than it actually is, I guess, although it can be used to do very cool things when put together correctly. Um, but all of these things, diamond versus graphite especially, you can think of, for them to literally just be carbon, both of them, carbon, nothing special, aside from the way it's arranged and have such different properties, like it's just super cool, okay?